Excellent. All right. Greetings. Good morning. Sorry to be late. I was doing tech support for my better half. <laughs> no problem. She, she has a webinar coming up that she's performing in, so I had to plug in the better microphone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When is her webinar? Immediately or? Uh, she has a tech check at seven at uh, fifteen at quarter after. So right now, but the the webinar is not till the top of the hour. Okay. And what's that through? I don't remember seeing something from April about that. Usually she posts those. This one I think <clears throat> is private. It's for Hayworth. Okay. Yep. Yep. So. Uh, Always yeah. fun to see how her flux thinking is evolving. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's really interesting how our paths are sort of intertwined and converging. Right. <clears throat> her list for the flux group is massive. <laughs> it's big. It's big. Exactly. Hey, Lauren. Hey, Jack. Hey, Peter. Bentley. Bentley, you have the most awesome background. Uh, that's because it's fake. <laughs> Is it, 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 <clears throat> but you've chosen well, and, the, uh, and your processor is fast enough that there are no edges, and it helps that you have no, not a lot of hair on the top. Yes, all that. Uh, I specifically, no, actually, that's not. <laughs> but I can go to Hawaii if you prefer. Um, oh, so. but I like I like your kind of it's like a slate green kind of uh, color with a gradient. It's, it works great. Yeah, and the great thing about that is since it's a green screen, it hides some of the green bleed over and fade in. So it's a bit of a cheat. But. It's, it's nice work. Nice work. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, the problem with those virtual screens is that they kind of they get get really funky in terms of hand movements and other things because. Unless your processor is fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, well, in this case, I have an actual green screen. Uh, so uh, the processing is a lot more accurate than um, the AI based stuff they're doing. Exactly. My, my MacBook is, sorry, you're going to say, <clears throat> my, my MacBook is old enough that it, it says, sorry, can't do this. But then if I have a green screen, we're okay. Same sort of thing. In the future, the AI is getting absolutely amazing. You're going to be able to say whatever background you want. It's going to be fully animated. No one will be able to tell. I plan to look like Peter Van in the future. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, face swaps will be all the thing too. You won't, you I'll get won't my see hair me back. anymore. Oh uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and well, you can have a, an arrow through your head, you can, the whole thing. Like Snapchat already does that. Sorry, Judy. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, then we can create our fantasy persona. Um, exactly. Yeah, and, and get further from oh, reality. Sure. Yeah, and we can have like a furry convention in here. Has everybody seen? <laughs> Has everybody seen the TikTok video where their owners use Snapchat to look like cats and then show their cats the situation? No, that oh would be there. Oh my God, it's hilarious. So, so basically, you're seeing what the, what the phone is taking and there's a cat kind of looking at the camera and behind it is the master and the master suddenly looks like a cat. And the cat, you see the cat <laughs> do that. <laughs> and in some cases, like bad at it. In other cases, just bolt from the scene. But the cat realizes what just happened. It's like, this is just too weird for me. <laughs> so. Cats being wonderful subjects for all sorts of experimentation. And it sounds, like a, it sounds like a Skinner thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we have, a, we have two calls today, in case anybody's up for this. The, this afternoon is the hoedown, which is a comparison of, of tools and methods. Uh, which I think will be a little chaotic and fun. Uh, and then this is our normal weekly check-in. And I, I thought we'd just do a really quick sort of check-in. Uh, I didn't have plan to present a particular thing. I wanted to figure out where is everybody, what is everybody interested in, uh, and then go, to, go for that for a little bit. Um, so let's do a, a little check-in. Let's see, uh, Jack, Judy, Hamilton. So Jack, can you check in? First, you have to find the unmute button, which is hiding from me right now. And it's still hiding. There we go. It takes me a while. And with this morning uh, tremor, it's hard to target that thing. There's a, somebody's got a, a, a mouse adapter for a tremor, except it only works on Windows. I'm oh, waiting no. for it to come up for the Mac so I could uh, 
uh, but when I get excited, uh, these hands get really crazy. So uh, why am I excited now? This is such a cool group. Um, checking in, what can you know? I just I just see people here that I've you know I interact with on other other tribes, and uh, I see people here that I don't know that I've ever met, and so this is this is going to be very interesting. Um, so, so, so my game is taming global conversations, and that's that's really you know what gets me out of bed every morning is is this idea that that it is physically possible to actually bring together disparate tribes if you break them up into tiny small groups and give them something to do that's 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 meaningful. Uh, and, and specifically, I'm 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 making the case that World of Warcraft and global sense making can be merged in into a kind of a unity that uh, uh, will allow a large enough portion portion of this planet to come together that we might actually start solving problems. That's that's where my head's at. Over. Very cool. Thank you. And I. I type in the chat that you are top requests, so people uh, who are interested in your context can, can Google that, et cetera. Uh, love that. Uh, Judy? Uh, <clears throat> for those of you who haven't met me, Judy Benham from Minnesota. Um, I've been interested in getting people together to change things my whole life and like the dynamism of that, um, find the challenge of it occasionally very challenging and welcome this opportunity to try to do it in a more virtual sense, in more real time, and actually get things done. And I met Judy ages ago uh, through the American Chemical Society. I think I did a speech there. Uh, I'm probably one of the few people here too that's kind of that has a 30-year corporate career at 3M. <laughs> so I'm awesome. not from the tech community per se. Thank you. Uh, Hamilton, then Ken, then Matt. Morning. Afternoon, good day, everybody. Uh, happy Thursday. Uh, don't have a lot of of stuff to share, me or maybe I have too much stuff to share in the time. So uh, maybe that's the way to look at it. Uh, I will say, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I've I've done a lot of sleuthing on who you people are. I've trolled you guys behind the scenes. It's so fascinating who you are. We haven't really. And by I get it. To do a rich introduction would be three calls of all these people. So, um, but. I'm from Collective Next, if I never said that. Uh, and one thing I'd love to say, maybe to push and ask for some feedback is Hank, Matt and I, we just, uh, our company, we just launched a new website that's trying to tell our story about what we do and who we are. And so uh, I would love for you guys to see it and tell us what you think. Um, that's a shameless plug and an ask, maybe borderline nefarious introduction, but there you have it. Perfect, like for new things. I'll a put little, it in the chat. A little swirl of mystery is useful to any conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Ken. Yeah, <clears throat> my focus these days. I'm uh, I'm very interested in um, the work of Thomas Metzinger, um, uh, who basically argues that human consciousness exists inside of a virtual construct, um, not just mental but bodily as well which is totally transparent to the consciousness um, because it brings up the immediate point of if you're living in a model, how does the model change? Hmm. And so I spend a lot of time uh, trying to find the, um, the points at which you can see historically that possibly the whole underlying cultural model people were using changed and to interpret the world. And of course, uh, we are in fact living through a period, I think, where that is happening big time. Um, and uh, yeah, but it's not subjectivity. That in fact, well, the whole idea is that that the model is totally transparent. Uh, the there there are not um, it's personal choices 
whatever. Uh, subjectivity is only something that only happens inside of reality. And reality is only what, ha what happens inside of the model. Um, so things that break the model are not experienced as subjective experiences. Mm -hmm. They're more like um, uh, insanity or religious inspiration or something. But uh, subjectivity is how you would think about it if you stayed inside of our current model. So you've just set a new goal for this afternoon's hoedown because the brain that I'm showing you is actually a model inside the model inside the model that we're all playing a game inside of. So if one of us breaks through the shell and manages to get root access, we're all good. <laughs> there is no, <laughs> Metzinger makes the point that it's like being in the matrix, but there is no underlying reality. Hmm. There is, the, you cannot escape the model. That's the challenging part. Mm -hmm. hmm. And Ken and I used to be neighbors in Berkeley. Uh, he used to run SeedWiki, and we did many a fun experiment with SeedWiki, which I will probably relate here because you can in some way trace uh, a lot of what's happening here to what we were messing around with uh, back then. Uh, he also knows way too much about military history. <clears throat> um, Matt, and then uh, Matt, then Hank, then Kuri. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Um, so there's a couple of things. One is I, uh, since the last time we spoke, really got turned on to the concept of Web3, right? Um, and for I, I think most people might be familiar with that. Um, but if you're not, Web1 was really a transactional web, um, whether it's commerce or communication. Web2 was, you know, defined, is defined as a social web. Um, and with the promise of the wisdom of the crowd, but um, really um, has turned into the madness of the masses. Um, and that Web3, uh, as I understand it, and I'd love, I'd love to learn more here, is has this idea of expertise and, and intelligence um, on top of it. And that intelligence, at least in my mind, could be artificial, but I also think it requires human intelligence. And, um, so one of the things that I'm working on right now is how do you build a sort of a web three type um, uh, set of conditions with inside of an organization so that organization is not just um, making choices either from the expert on the top, um, or, you know, CEO, but, um, or just leaving it to the masses to, to control it, but really layers on that intelligence. So that's, that's one thing that I've, I've been thinking about. The other thing um, is I have a personal friend who is um, a CEO of a big company who uh, revealed to me recently that he has early onset Alzheimer's and has asked me to help him story thread, um, to use words that you know Jerry has used, help him construct a, um, a way of articulating not only his life and who he is and those kind of classic stories, but also to begin to almost create his body of knowledge in the financial services um, yeah. sector, which he spent his whole life to almost create almost like a, um, you know, a starter, a starter dough. Um, and um, so I'm looking for some collaborators who might want to participate in conversations with this individual to start to, to use his access into this world as a way of of you know, kind of creating the beginnings of a story thread of where we are um, with our financial systems um, globally. So um, I just put that out there. And then uh, if we do this right, we can move right toward uploading his mind into the cloud. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, yeah, Oop, come on little brain, don't be so slow. Uh, Hank, why don't you go ahead and check in while I am busy waiting for my brain to move around. There we go. Um, uh, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, you know, the, for the past couple of weeks, I've been thinking about some of the same things as uh, 
Matt and Jerry and Hamilton because I work with them um, and talk to them often. <laughs> but um, on, a, on a more personal note, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about how social – how the pressures of life around us kind of like put our souls into tension um, and how that tension can be directed intentionally towards uh, good things. Um, what should those good things be? How do we direct that tension? How do we harness that tension and actually like truly participate? Um, so I've really just been kind of trying to think about how do I like integrate the things that I'm doing into, you know, I don't really want to call it a goal because sometimes things can't just specifically be articulated as a goal, but maybe an aim. Right. Um, so that's fine. Love that. Thank you. Um, Kuri, then Hari, then Julian. Hola. So um, I'm down in Florida, born and raised in Miami and Kuri is my Cuban nickname. Uh, so Jerry knows me as Goody. Jerry and I have been working together. He pulled me into this uh, beautiful circus here. Um, uh, Jerry and I are actually engaged with a client right now. And what I do is work with um, organizations on strategic change, fundamental change, disruptive change, and usually don't succeed. Usually the, the models, uh, to refer back to Ken's idea there, is the mental models and constructs are pretty hard wired. And I try a lot of, we try a lot of different approaches to get them to uh, bend their models a bit and see a larger future version of themselves. It doesn't always work, but it takes the form of me a lot of different type of gameplay. Kumu maps, as Gene was demonstrating the other day, are good friends of mine. I use those a lot. A uh, variety of ways to hack uh, mindsets in organizations and get them to see bigger, more impactful versions of themselves. And I tend to do that a lot around higher ed, academics, uh, universities, libraries, publishers, and I take the occasional corporate gig too. So that's me. Well, thank you. And thank I believe you. You, I believe you can see launches from Kennedy from your, from it's, your house, right? it's good. It's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Hari? Okay, guys. Um, Hari from India here. So I'm, I'm here for the first time at this uh, meeting. So I, uh, I've just been, uh, namaste. <laughs> so, Where are you from, Hari? Sorry? Where are you from? I couldn't hear. I'm from, I'm from India, from Bangalore in India, in oh, the okay. south of India. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for uh, you know like inviting me to this thing. Uh, I, I would say it's very hard to describe myself uh, except uh, my identity is a work in progress, and uh, the way I'm thinking about it now is uh, there's a circle and it's called sustainability. And everyone I meet, I look for the intersection and at least try and find something in common. Uh, one of my current topics of interest is uh, sustainability in in the information society. So I've been uh, reading a lot about post-industrial societies and the evolution of that debate, basically from the perspective that uh, how do you do decision making in a society like that? And what are the wider implications of a spillover of that kind of society to uh, places which are not prepared for it, for example, the global south. So uh, I'm reading a lot about those kinds of things and uh, just following the, uh, you know, like uh, where it leads. You know? so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to today. Uh, the the uh, the jam which we're going to have later on on uh, systems mapping because I'm I, I I want to apply those techniques to uh, problem solving in the uh, in the domains of waste management and climate action contextualized to uh, my situation. You just muted yourself. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Basically, to to the context which I operate in right now. So that's my and immediate I'm, exercise. And I'm sorry that this afternoon's call will be so late for you. I apologize. No worries. No worries. No worries. Um, and also, the, the, the rocks that you're turning over, there's just so much in them. So uh, pl plenty to, to do and talk about here. Um, Absolutely. Juli thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Julian, then Pete, then Kevin Jones. Hi, uh, morning. So my particular bent is to make knowledge as manageable as a glass of water. And uh, another way to describe that would be that if you think of Minority Report and Tom Cruise is out there waving his hands, um, something like that, except it's for real. And so this entails several areas, one of which is the immersive tech that's needed in order to visualize and manage whatever it is, it being knowledge. Uh, how do you define knowledge, which has a lot of background? And then the cognitive science that humans use to interact with reality needs to interact with whatever this other reality is, whatever you want to call it. And all of these need to be combined. So everything I'm doing these days is focused on bringing all these different disciplines together in a, in a way that it can be put onto a digital system 
and thus people can define and manage their knowledge. Awesome, thank you. And like our president does have trouble managing water now and then, but that's a totally different issue. <laughs> um, Pete, Pete, then Kevin, then Laura. Uh, hi, I'm Peter Kaminsky. Uh, my, my passion kind of is helping people uh, accomplish what they want to do. <clears throat> um, so tools and processes. Um, I've got a tech background and a Silicon Valley background. Uh, so another thing I like to do is try to help level playing fields. Um, uh, helping for a long time, it's been helping people who are non-technical use technical tools, but that's kind of balanced out uh, well. So I, I think maybe I need to look uh, for other, other kinds of people who don't have access to the kinds of tools they should have. Um, in the context of this group, one of the things that one of the one of the story threads in my in my life is watching uh, superorganisms. Um, uh, I think it's it's really fascinating to me that people tend to think that they're individuals and the the you know if they were drawing a diagram of themselves, their individuality would be most of it, and then around the edges is the things that you participate in. You know, your country or your schools or your tribes or um, churches. The, so for me, I feel like it's kind of the other way around. Um, and we live as tiny little moats inside these big super organisms. Um, churches or belief systems or countries or companies or, or whatever. And so what I see, if I look over the history of the past, you know, 1000, 2000 years or something like that, is these super organisms that have people inside them um, but the superorganisms are really the thing, the cultural shifts and things like that are the things that have um, uh, adaptation and evolution. Uh, so we had churches kind of get supplanted by cities and cities get supplanted by states and now we've got states and corporations warring with each other. Um, and people, individuals, feel like they have a lot of control over, you know, agency in that situation. Um, and I, I, you know, and they don't really. Um, there's a, a little agency. So helping people band together to create intentional organisms and, and organisms that are more humane, I think is, is something I'm really interested in. And the the, the trick, I, the, one of the tricks I've kind of learned uh, in thinking about this is that once you leave, um, a, uh, once you get a system that's bigger than an individual or bigger than a couple individuals, uh, you know, once you have, um, once you have a city or, or uh, uh, some kind of lord uh, who can have a collective, um, collective control over resources and work, then you've got a thing that's gotten bigger than, than a, one human can control it, right? Even the guy, uh, usually a guy who's in charge of all the grain and all the, the slaves um, is kind of, uh, he's, he's not really in control as much as, as the system dynamics of all of that stuff and the system dynamics of um, that his little fiefdom warring or cooperating with a neighboring fiefdom. Um, so, uh, so that's where, you know, for, for this, or, uh, this, this group, that's where um, I'm interested in kind of poking around and, and uh, learning. Thank you. And I'm, I'm no philosopher and no political scientist, but the political philosophy of what's going on is absolutely riveting, <clears throat> just riveting. And there's so many good works and ideas about what's going on. And we're in this really plastic <coughs> Ruder moment where so many things are, are possible to change that we could tip one way or the other. So I'm hoping we have a little to do with that as well. Uh, Kevin, then Lauren, then Scott. And I'll just before I even let Kevin have the mic, I'll say that he is the reason I am married to April right now. That uh, uh, he was. And also not, yesterday, too, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was not setting us up, but he, he thought we had some ideas and comments. So he invited us both for coffee at the Ferry Building in San Francisco some years ago. And uh, a week later, we showed up at his door with flowers. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I've yeah. forgotten that part. So, right. sorry, I just thought I'd refresh your memory. Uh, go ahead. <coughs> no yeah. pressure. Well, you know, 
Um, you know, I, one of my business has been about bringing people together, uh, figuring out. Apparently, you do that well. A long, what's that? Apparently, you do that well. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it works. You know, uh, we should probably <laughs> check with April to see get a current update. But anyway, yeah. um, I've been working on um, accelerating the flow of capital to good for about twenty years, and uh, we just got invited in by a group of black churches around Allentown, Pennsylvania, who want. To, a credit union. I just happen to be working with a credit union that wants to do uh, congregational based uh, micro nodes. And they didn't get, you know, um, like the PPP loans, uh, like other folks did, and the banks aren't working for them. And we think we'll have a replicable model of this thing, but we're going to go. Luckily, I mean, it's just kind of odd. I've, I've been creating a proposal for a, 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 a parish based credit union that could be a replicable node. And then this group reached out to a friend I've been talking to and said, man, we really need a credit union because the bank suck for us. And so we're hopefully going to do something. So I do that kind of thing. Awesome, Kevin. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Lauren, then Scott. Okay, so uh, last week we were discussing uh, maybe <laughs> setting up another call to do some practical uh, collective intelligence. And I think I'm uh, going to host a call then on Monday evening CET, that's European time. So that's nine CET, which is three o'clock Eastern time and 12 o'clock Pacific time. So um, yeah, so the idea is to talk about kind of social issues, but um, combine this uh, kind of relevant social issues with all of these mapping tools and ideas. So I'm really looking for people who have theories that they want to test out and practice or just advice uh, to give me and how to actually structure these. Um, so I want to make kind of like a um, something that's scalable where um, people come, we find some way of getting people into rooms together. That's a good way of matching people, not entirely sure how to do that, and then have them produce something that's both fun to work on and kind of educational things that can be tweeted, fun things, like we want to make puppet shows and stuff like that. So um, to make good graphics and basically kind of like a, dare I say it, kind of like an advertising arm of um, actually making and producing interesting memes. So the idea is to take a kind of hashtags that we get from these kind of various salon groups that are around that are kind of talking these things into existence and then make it into a thing and explain it and um, then uh, kind of promote it and measure how effective we are at actually um, getting it, willing that into existence and making it a real thing. So that's kind of the concept. I love anyone who wants to come and direct things and to um, help set, set up how we do it. It's basically a testing grounds for uh, developing the um, open global mind model and to get real information and feedback. So that's a concept. You'll Will put you it in. Up? You'll, you'll send it out to everybody. Sure. The, the Zoom info. Sure. That yeah. If people want to hear it. Sounds one, great. Please put it on the uh, on the OGM list. Um, that's exactly what I was going to say, Judy. Thank you. Um, that sounds awesome. And. And we're doing check-ins right now, but part of the reason I did story threading uh, on a previous call was I'm really interested in setting up story threading as a business. And I, I, I think I'm probably like probably the Ur story threader, uh, but there are other people on this call who'd be fabulous story threaders who might want to try it out. And it would be really nice if five years from now, people you know, who were looking for graphic facilitators said, oh, and I'd like to also have a story threader in our meeting because it's going to make the meeting better, right? And that can be, and story threaders are the kinds of people who would be really ace uh, meme generators. Uh, so Kevin, um, story, uh, I'll send you a link or I'll, I'll, when somebody else is talking, I'll put a link here in the chat to the video for the OGM call about story threading where we explain it and discuss it. And five different people made comments that I hadn't realized were important parts of how to describe story threading. So the, the call really enriched the idea. Uh, and it was born from my frustration of going to events where people are drawing beautiful maps of what's being said on the wall on, on you know, large sheets of paper. And then I get a snapshot later of that sheet of paper. 
and nobody refers back to it. It's not really an ongoing memory. If it's really good, it, it, it becomes an artifact during the conference and people point to the place on the wall where yesterday uh, the, the recorder drew that really cool bridge with, uh, with the concepts. But, but why, can we enrich recording, but can we also then riff on what's being said and done in the meeting so that the minority reports, I'm going back there intentionally, Kulian, uh, so that the minority reports that show up in the meeting, the little interesting sparks that usually get snuffed out by group process, actually get some oxygen and maybe take off as memes and maybe take off as initiatives that the people at the event didn't realize they needed to do because that person who said the crazy idea was just a little early, which is what happens with all good ideas. They're just a little too early, so they sound completely kooky to the, the first people who, who, who hear them. And how do we sort of go beyond that? So story threading is meant to, to sort of harness uh, that energy in that capacity. Lauren, I really love what you're proposing. And it's sort of like dendritic growth of thought and ideology. Um, so I'm excited to talk further about that. It's funny that you say that, Jerry, because my thing is exactly for people with kooky ideas who have no place. So we're just like, people are just like, you're a weirdo. Is this <laughs> or like you're the, too much. <laughs> this is the, the, the kooky idea homeless. <laughs> yeah, they, may, they may have a physical structure over their head, but their kooky idea has no home. We can find them a home. We can have, we can have like a kooky idea adoption shelter. <laughs> Sounds reasonable to me. Um, I've lost track of my cue because people are moving around on me here. Scott, I think you were next. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my video is not working because sometimes if I'm using various Zoom meeting things, they one takes over and doesn't let go. So anyway, um, I'm new to this. I am much less accomplished. I know none of you would, would say that, but I'm much less accomplished than all of you. But my, <laughs> my feeling in all of this is that my role to play is bringing these topics to people who are not as well accomplished and interesting and deep in it as you all are. And what I think is fascinating is you guys are so smart and well-connected and well-read. And when I try to talk to other people, I find that they don't even know that this exists, let alone have, have taken any, any depth in any of the subjects that, you, that you're really talking about. And one thing I've found is that our, our young people, as they're getting out of school, are able to follow directions really well. And yet if they're presented with a chaotic system, they have no idea what to do, where to start, anything like that. And so what I'm interested in is collecting a set of what I would call meta skills um, so that they can approach problems on their own. And I find these discussions fascinating because I'm able to glean uh, simple approaches to system thinking or to idea mapping or to visual thinking or whatever it happens to be. And I hope to be able to bring those to kids so that they start out because I'm, I'm 54 and I'm, I started this this journey you know maybe a decade ago but most recently in the last couple of years and I just think wow what would have happened if I had been building my brain 30 years ago as someone I know might have been doing <laughs> so anyway that's kind of my uh, my my spiel that's awesome Scott thank you where's home for you Home is interlocking Michigan, so it is up in the up in the woods in the water. So, mm -hmm. awesome! And now I have to cross the top of my Google Gallery. So, Gene, Peter, and then Bentley. I'm Gene Bellinger, and if you were here last week, so was I. Um, I live on a sandbar on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. I'm here for two reasons. One, because 20 some odd years ago, Jerry introduced me to the Brain 1.0 at a conference and I was so captivated I had to go back to my room and install it on my laptop during the first break. And it's been a love-hate relationship ever since with the Brain, not with Jerry. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> like this, is, 
the, I find the interface so seductive that I just, I get so upset from time to time that I actually delete it from my system and six months later it's back again. It's like, it's like a recurring disease. And, and this particular project is an effort on my part to get out more. Which is, and it's a very appropriate time to be getting out more. The, the coronavirus thing, lifestyle is, is the natural thing for me. Yeah, <laughs> coronavirus like uh, pen at uh, lockdown is the way for me. Um, thank you, uh, Peter. Yes, I'm uh, calling from Belgium, from Flanders. Um, I just came out of a call with uh, Robert Poynton, who wrote a book about pause, do pause, and another one about do improv. Uh, and we were discussing about this and other things that have to do with how to um, have agency in a world that's constantly uh, shifting under you. And he used a quote from uh, Kierkegaard, and I'm not sure that that's the exact quote, but it was about we comprehend backwards and we live forward. Hmm. So I, I think a lot of what we have been doing so far, if, if we now look at the, the brain, at Jerry's brain, we comprehend backwards by noticing and seeing more of what Jerry has seen. And somewhere I'm, um, I'm trying to find how we can see or live forward and see and making more likely the future that's already there in the sense of there are a lot of propensities that somebody can notice. So how can we notice propensities in the open global mind and give shape to a future that we desire. Um, I like the word give shape uh, in the sense that uh, it's about imagination, but it's also shape like uh, a um, scaffold, which is helping shape the end form of something of a building or whatever it is. And somewhere during that conversation, Robert, uh, consciously or unconsciously, he said, he spoke a sentence or a line that I like a lot, walking backwards into the future, elegantly take advantage of opportunities. Elegantly take advantage of opportunities. So I think I'm in here, I, mean, I think Jerry asked me here for some uh, possible skill that's emerging on my site for thread weaving. Story for threading. Stor story threading and mm -hmm. what I'm doing in, in life, it's um, uh, creating artistic interventions, provocations and interruptions or intervals of possibility. Hi, I'm Bentley Davis. Um, I, uh, I like uh, building, I'm experimenting right now with building tools to increase mass agreement um, and um, playing around with uh, making is uh, opening Jerry's brain, making it open source. Um, although only if, the, only if someone's gonna actually look at it, use it, and we gotta make sure it's updatable. Um, so it may not be doable, but I was able to export a lot of the data, so. Those are the type of things I'm playing with. I'm currently unemployed, but not underemployed. Um, so I'm just looking for the best way I can uh, contribute my skills and time to the world. Brilliant, thank you, Bentley. And where's home? Uh, Dallas, Texas, Big D. Wow, Big D, little a, double L-A-S. That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and, and so Beth, there have been over, I've been using the brain for 22 years and <clears throat> many people have approached me about the brain and data, but Bentley went and just started sort of messing with it and, and exported uh, into web pages, uh, basically with links on them, an interesting portion of the brain in a pretty easy way. And I had just been interacting with someone else who was having a lot of trouble with the brain because the brain's JSON is non-standard and a bunch of other stuff. And he, and, and the other party was like, pretty upset with the brain and, and not going to touch it. And Bentley just went and poop, 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 you know, ninja, poop, 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 here we go. And, and so I, th I think there's a, a, I think there's a small um, conversation to be had in this group, in this project called something like, I'm just going to propose free Jerry's brain. Um, and, and, and I want to say that because I'm sitting here, I'm torn with the idea so far, all the thoughts that are in my brain, I've put in personally over 22 years, and it's, I don't, I'm not using team brain, which is a version of the brain they have that might let me cooperate, but the method of cooperation in that doesn't really work. So how, how do I get out of the brain and into something else, or how do I make my brain's data much more, vastly more accessible and useful to everybody else? Because I've been curating for a while. I have a hunch it's a little bit useful. And so Bentley, what you've done just by, just by going and doing it, is a fantastic sort of leading edge of that. And I would love to do more around that and figure out how to do this. In particular, I have a vested interest in how do we do these experiments so that I can then continue curating the body that I've been working on, and not lose a, you know, I don't mind super distribution. I'm toying, we've had a bit of the conversation of could we use a GitHub model, a fork and pull model with my brain data. And I'm not sure that the brain is adapted to that or GitHub would necessarily work that way, but uh, and then there's plenty of, of chat that's happening on the uh, in the chat around this. So I I think this is a, a really interesting juicy place for us to to start experimenting. Go ahead. Well, that's that's all I had. So, um, but yeah, I'm excited <laughs> excited about all that. There there are a few limitations, like I can't figure out a way to detect updates you've made so i'd have to re-download the whole brain and i don't want to take down the brain.com trying to pull your because that's a lot of data jerry <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh it only really works with the way you've used it because i haven't put it in the features a lot of people use the notes fields but you don't so i hardly um, do i don't very much it would really just be your brain for now uh we could work on other things but yeah it's oh. a good start yeah, thank you. And for and for example, it would be really interesting if the notes field in the brain instead were a Rome database or some other uh, Giri Lagos, who's a part of this group, has his own Rome-like thing that he's inventing, and he runs really deep on transclusion and Doug Engelbart and and uh, Ted Nelson and a whole bunch of those sorts of things. So um, so in some sense, in some sense, a piece of what we're doing also is realizing some of the visions of the visionaries from way back when that also, like Minority Report, that motivated a lot of us to be where we are. I mean, uh, you know, Ted Nelson's visions and uh, Doug Engelbart's Memex uh, motivated generations uh, of people already uh, to go do information-y kind of things. <clears throat> Has anybody heard about the Zettelkasten? Raise your hand if you've heard of Zettelkasten. One, two, three, <clears throat> three, four of us, four of us, yeah. Uh, the uh, Zettel is a little piece of paper, a Kasten is a box. So a Zettelkasten is a box of slips of paper. And this guy, Nicholas Luhrmann, I'll, I'll show him in my brain in a second, uh, a while back, created an indexing system for himself out of paper. It, there, were, he, he, there were no computers available to him at the time. And he created a method where he was coding the little indexes. So each box had a unique ID, which was part of the unique identifier for each card. And then he proceeded to cross-reference the cards because he had a coding mechanism that would allow him to create threads through the topics, through the card decks. And he used this, uh, he was a prolific writer. He used this through the years to generate books and white papers and all that kind of stuff. Um, and what's funny is there's a whole, if you, if you Google title costume, you'll find a bunch of people basically trying to replicate his thing, which to me seems like a silly idea because we're so much further with computer technology. Why would you want to create an arcane coding system and emulate an index card? I'm like, man, why, why would you want to adopt the limitations of Zettelkasten? And yet the ideas of Luhrmann on that are, are very much on the same plane as the Memex. In fact, much more practical than the Memex because the Memex was just a thought experiment on the part you know, of, of Vannevar Bush uh, way back when. Uh, so, uh, Gene, uh, you're muted. How do you Jake. see that varying from using types and tags in the brain? 
Um, well, what happens in people trying to emulate subtle custom is that you wind up having arcane codes that become part of how the user has to interact with the system, where I see that what, what the task that's being facilitated is a, per, is a wonderful task and is necessary, and Rome kind of does that naturally. Why, why would you want to have a card with a code on it? Mm. And some users may want the card with a code on it, and if, we can, if, we, if OGM can be a platform that allows for that, fabulous, right? But, but for me, like, when I see people trying to instantiate great ideas, one of the problems with Doug Engelbart uh, toward the end of his life was that, um, and uh, many of you probably know Eric Eugene Kim, who's been a, a who was a, sort of studied under Doug Engelbart and tried to help him cre recreate the original uh, aug augmentation system uh, online. But Engelbart, once he had arrived at his vision, didn't flex it at all and wouldn't change it at all and just wanted to reinstantiate the original vision. And I, I met a guy, uh, Kirk Carlson, who was trying to fund him at SRI, where uh, Engelbart had a, a seat. And it was just really a, a frustrating thing back and forth uh, over and over. So we have Julian, then Ken. So I wanted to bring up the notion of a soup, which is, if you remember the Apple Newton, it didn't have uh, files as we're accustomed to on a computer. It had a soup. And when you were trying to get information out, it would pull out the kinds of information that you were interested in at the moment that you asked for the information. So for example, somebody's address or somebody's birthday. And this follows the, uh, the whole idea of the MVC paradigm that came out of Xerox Park many, many years ago. And the idea is that, sure, you've got this collection of knowledge, your knowledge base, uh, that's the model of your data, but then there are different ways of looking at it. In the IT world, when you people talk about their databases, they're actually interacting with it through a view. Because for example, you call for help and that person's got their CRM system and they get a view, but their manager gets another view, which has even more power. It's still the same data. It's just the way that you get to interact with it. Uh, so this was the basis for Apple creating the soup. And this also is the basis for where I'm going, because really when you think about it, a hierarchy is not a way of looking for that a hierarchy, like the files on your computer, that's a view of your files. It's not an organization. It's uh, not really the way to organize data because you can easily find pieces of your data that don't work with a hierarchy. Really what's needed is to look at what is the person interested in, what can you find out that is related to that interest. And this is a very dynamic process. And going back to what I said a minute ago in my introduction, I'm interested in using cognitive science because for example, uh, let's see, very often when you're talking to somebody, this is how you would indicate it. Like, that there, I'm interested in that there, or that, or this. And this is how all humans work, is that they use their, their cognitive abilities to emphasize what it is they're going for. And imagine if this here meant to your system, that's what I'm interested in, it's that stuff there. And technology has actually reached the point where this not only is this sensed, uh, but it's cheap to come up with the hardware to do that. And so when you talk about your information, it should not be uh, just what you can get on a screen, but rather what you can do as a human to indicate, this is my area of interest and find me stuff on this. And by doing that, we're able to abstract whatever this knowledge is back to the way the humans work instead of forcing the human to come up with a mapping from how the humans work to what that particular piece of software can understand. Thank you. Kim and Judy. The arcane path, I think, think about it as a story um, human beings always take a very complex situation and make a simpler version of it to think about. And the paths through lots of data are, are really stories about how someone found their way, you know, through the data. The, the issue, no matter what system you, you come up with to organize lots of data is the organization in a very Kierkegaardian sense immediately becomes your biggest problem mm. because human beings also have extreme tunnel vision. It takes almost nothing to trigger it. And once it's triggered, you're completely blind to anything else in the problem space. So I, I've come to believe that, uh, I mean, in thinking fast and slow, he says you cannot address your own blindness, but the person's sitting next to you can. The only way out of the, all the knowledge problems is, is to 
fly with a co-pilot to you know have some effective way of working as a team because you cannot from a a single point of view overcome your mind's leverage um and uh, there's a whole place we can go to from here but uh the documentary hypernormalization by adam curtis talks about how we are currently in a nonlinear war nonlinear war in in, in uh, involve disinformation and spin and malinformation and a bunch of other things. Uh, and uh, part of our huge political problem right now and the global shift to the far right is this, is, is that it's so easy to trigger tunnel vision. And once we do that, our short-term memory goes away. We'll, we'll, once we don't trust anything in the arena, we'll grab any narrative that we like or that our friends like so that we can remain part of, that, our, of our tribe because <clears throat> when everything else is melting, your tribe becomes even more important. Et cetera, like there's layers of and layers of juicy stuff that's active in the world right now that can just pry it open. So thank you for that. Um, Judy. I just wanted to riff a little bit on the multidimensionality aspect because a lot of the creative act energy that is engendered in any group is triggering <clears throat> various little ideas that go off in other directions. And so it's constantly morphing and that's in conflict with the attempt to organize. So in terms of how we would model this, uh, it would be really great if we had, you know, the endless threading option of different directions, because what we don't want is all of the convergence unless it's really a groundswell of the right idea. And part of what, why story threaders are called story threaders is that there is a threading of nuggets of, of ideas that are in the world <clears throat> and what the story thread is doing is they're calling attention to a particular thread, which is a narrative. <clears throat> and the narrative could be historic, it could be how did we get here, it could be prospective, it could be where, how do we get out of this mess? But it's, but it's their choice of narrative from among the many presented in the hyphae, in the sort of mycelial network of ideas that is in fact sort of out there if you're looking, right? So. Um, so I, I very much want to represent what you're saying. Go ahead. Mike. Well, there's a, there's a piece of it that it's kind of like the dynamic tension between convergent and divergent ideas. Right. Because as you're doing all of the ideation, you're thinking divergently. And if you can keep the crowd divergent, then you get lots and lots of ideas. And then you can maybe take a look at them and screen to the things that people have the most energy for or that seem the most feasible or certain things like that. And I don't know how to commence how to I'm not a techie first of all so I don't know how to capture that in a service process that works for people but what I most love about calls is that constant dynamic flow between divergent and convergent people bring in a new idea and we rip on that and then we that takes us in another direction and it's just continual exciting evolution of thought and I don't know how to capture that technologically and just, <clears throat> Kevin, I'll go to you in just a sec. Um, and just to add a layer to this, I, I'm a big proponent for memory and in particular collective memory. Um, and the, our, part of our problem is that we, we tend to think of life as a series of events. We'll have a meeting or a conference or a thing. And in the conference, we'll, if a clever facilitator will take us into divergent thinking and then convergent thinking. And then we'll have, you know, uh, prototypes and then we'll like design thinking or whatever, el what other, whatever other kind of process you want. Um, but life is ongoing, right? And, and, and same thing, I have the same problem with politics where once every four years we get to vote for one of two parties that usually <clears throat> sound remarkably similar, right? And don't, aren't really exploring the space of governance. Uh, and in between, we're not thinking governance. Like that's kind of crazy because things are always ongoing, things are getting rich, events are happening. That, that like the news business is somehow separate from the election business except when it's covering elections. And if we were curating what we know ongoing, we could feed off it all the time. And then we need to figure out architecturally, mentally, metaphorically, where are the places to go to get things done as Lauren took us early in the call. Like, okay, great. So we have a rich background. We can, we can feed it, we can pull from it, but let's go, let's go pull this one out and make it a thing in the world. <coughs> right. And, and how do we, I, I don't know, you know, metaphorically, are we separating? Are we putting it back? How does that all kind of work? So Kevin, then Matt. Um, yeah, you know, thinking about things counter to this way of thinking, <clears throat> it recalls the time back in 2003, I was uh, doing uh, 
some investigative and undercover reporting with the Christian right that were trying to keep the uh, first gay Episcopal bishop, uh, openly gay Episcopal bishop from being elected. And there was a convention and I started looking at all the small things that they were opposing as opposed to the big things they had messaging around. <clears throat> and uh, the um, there was this one little thing where they were trying to do a, a meeting between South Korean and North Korean people of the same denomination and then they opposed it. Says, why? You know, you're really just kind of demonizing these other people. And, and the woman said to me, yeah, they need to be demonized. And so I got into that with her. Uh, and, and the thing was, they needed to be demonized because she worked from an infection uh, basic metaphor that you were on a slippery slope. And if you went that way, you would be exposed and you could become like them. And so the, the counter thing they, they have is being militant and separatist and literal where possible, where they just use some text as their wall. <clears throat> but it was uh, people who don't think like this often come from an infection metaphor. And that was, the, you know, the discovery, that was at the heart of uh, where they were coming from. And, and that was why they felt a need to restrict open thought. That's super interesting, Kevin. Thank you. And, <clears throat> you know, the idea that memes are contagious is part of that, part of that same conversation. Right. <clears throat> this call is meant to be an hour long. I will hang out after, but uh, I know Peter has to go and several of you may have to go. No worries. It's recorded. We're going to put it uh, online. Uh, and thank you for being here. With that, to Matt. Um, maybe just to connect a few uh, a few dots. Um, I, I'm still curious about this idea of the super organism and how um, people are agents of the idea versus they are um, the agents that are creating the idea, right? Uh, in that relationship. And um, I also have this sense of, you know, human beings are, our natural state is in extended families, tribes, larger groups of people, um, you know, problem solving being not an individual sport, but a collective thought uh, sport. And, and the tunnel vision com comment that was brought up earlier about how we're naturally wired for tunnel vision. And I think about us as like a herding, you know, animal, you know, um, or species where the, that the individual out front, um, our defined leader has to have sort of that tunnel vision and the super organism and the meaning of that super organism is what defines their immediate actions and they are behaving along those, you know, in that pattern, right? Uh, danger is on the left, we, we turn right, food is on, you know, ahead, so we go ahead in, in sort of this sense. And that there's these, there are these bands, there's the masses, which follow the leader, but then there are these bands that live sort of on the side up front, which are the artists, the heretics, the, you know, the scientists that are drawing in and making, are doing the sense making and therefore they're creating new meaning for that super organism. And that new meaning then turns back into that tunnel, you know, in the into that tunnel vision, able to act and react in that, in that front position. And I, so all that being said, I, I wonder about, is this about changing a super organism from within through using the techniques of the artists and the heretics and the scientists and, you know, you know, those people who are, you know, creating new meaning in real time, or is this actually about establishing a new super organism, one that doesn't fall into the natural traps of um, super organism behavior or a new super organism that operates completely different outside the realm of um, the paradigms that we exist in today. And I think that's, you know, for me, Open Global Mind is a little bit about that new super organism and, and what, it, what it means. So let me pause there. I know that was a lot. So, so you just gave us a topic for the next hour, basically, if not the next couple of weeks, because uh, this is really rich. <laughs> uh, let me go to Pete. Um, I got to go, but I just keep, I want to say, keep the, um, Plato keeps coming to mind. But. And you mean Plato, yeah. the philosopher, not Plato, the molding clay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, see you next week. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, that was a great riff, Matt. Um, uh, and totally with you. I, one of the, one of the intuitions I have about 
human superorganisms as we live with them today um, is that uh, humans and our superorganisms co-evolved over the past 500 to 1,000 years, 1, 1,500 years maybe, to, to be uh, feudal. Uh, where you do have one person in front um, with tunnel vision, followed by a, a whole set of a whole flanks of people with tunnel vision. Um, I I don't think my my intuition is that when we were more scattered, when humans were more scattered, you probably had different kinds of superorganisms, ones that were very collaborative um, and problem solving and bounced ideas back and forth, uh, and what happened is the the feudal model is super successful. So mm -hmm. um, literally the feudal <laughs> organisms went around and squashed and killed or assimilated all the other ones until we're left with the model that we've got now where most of the super organisms are these, you know, armored tanks basically that roll over anything in its path. And, and so, maybe, and, and they're also at a global scale. Yeah, and they right. get bigger and bigger and bigger. So and when they I, fail, they yeah. So I I think you know I, maybe we can still look around the world and find cultures or or stories of cultures at this point um, where we where we collaborated differently, where we worked differently, and where this, this dominant feudal organization squashed them. But uh, so I as well as looking forward, um, I'm kind of inspired to look you know, in the past or, or imagine what was happening 2,000, 3,000, five years ago in different parts of the world. Before, I pass the, <clears throat> before passing the mic to Ken, I just want to say that telling these kinds of stories and answering these kinds of questions is sort of one of the missions of OGM. <clears throat> yep. Like, like I, I would love to see multiple versions of this and multiple opinions manifest in ways that other people outside of this conversation can use, interact with, enrich, a, a appropriate, modify, uh, replicate, riff on, remix, etc. So Ken, then Kevin. I think um, just as a metaphor, it might work better to think about these large things as machines than organisms. The organism metaphor has some stuff about it, but in particular, the the feudal machine didn't last past about Henry the Eighth. The the need for a more complex organization involving banks and different parts of society and whatever is probably what like the English Revolution is all about and mm -hmm. Oliver Cromwell and 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 you know Napoleon's mobilizing the entire country as an instrument of war we we have um, the organisms keep the machines, the social machines, which are probably all a variant of language, right? Human beings invented language because they were about to go literally extinct. And it's like the Ur machine, but, but the, you know, our ideas about authoritative leadership really come from fairly late. And a lot of them come from the Napoleonic War period, and a lot of that, I, I mean, ship captains, Dutch ship captains running a ship was a cooperative effort, whatever. There are historical reasons why the machine got bent in authoritative ways, but, you know, anyway, I could, I could go on, but the investigation of, of how the machines have evolved is very complicated and I find very interesting. It's totally fascinating and, and multiple history courses worth. Um, Kevin. Yeah, I, I, thinking about authority and <clears throat> empire, you know, the book Against the Grain is an interesting thing because grain is an annual and can be taxed really easily. A friend of mine wrote a book, Lesser Beasts, and the empires hated pigs because they could be providing uh, food around the edge and you couldn't control them and constrain them. And he's looking at several different things like that. And you don't see empires where there are tubers. Like that's one reason the Hawaii didn't go quite to an empire because that you can't really tax them. You can't drive, drive by and see them. I think, you know, grain and empire fit together, but uh, lesser beasts are, are they're, they're ways to create lesser beast economies, you know, around the edges of the empire. 
we destabilize it. James Scott is, is brilliant. I've read several of his books. He also wrote uh, two, uh, Three Cheers for Anarchy, no, Two Cheers for Anarchy, and uh, another one about <clears throat> basically how do you re rebel or dissent. Uh, and he's, I think, still a professor in New York, so I'd love to invite him to some of our conversations or make him a guest or something like that. If anybody has a link to James Scott directly, let me know and we can, we can invite. Um, where are we? And, and I want to say that conversations like the one that just surged up, I want to riff on these, I want to manifest them, I want to record them, I want to experiment with, like this afternoon we're going to take a whole bunch of different sort of mapping tools and, and mash them up against each other and just see what they do. It would be fun to tell these stories using many of these tools. It would be fun to figure out how this clicks into education. And, you know, in this age of Zoom University where, you know, uh, Orange County and a bunch of others said, nope, we're actually going to stay virtual. Thank you very much. We're not going in. Uh, we could do some things with education. We could invite some kids in. We could do a whole series of, of interesting things here. Uh, around these topics while as, as ways of exploring the tools and improving, uh, you know, what we're talking about. Uh, Judy. Well, it just struck me that what we're doing here that's so exciting is the multiplicity of ideas. And what we're starting to do is form little groups to flesh those out. But again, because of the population of these calls, those are pretty um, multitasking, multidimensional discussions. And it would be fascinating to really riff on how to create an insurrection of that type of behavior in larger mm. groups of humanity. So one of my secret hopes is that what we're doing here and the culture of OGM is contagious uh, <clears throat> and, and, and can underthrow uh, larger ways of doing things. Judith, I don't, uh, can you say what you said again? I, I, I think I missed the point. Probably not. That's often what happens. Um, what I love about this group is that every topic takes off instantly in 15 different directions because of right. the richness of all of the people. And I don't know how to potentiate that into action and continual riffing like that on all of these fascinating dimensions. With this particular group of people, it stays highly creative and really leads to integration and understanding that can potentiate action. But the ideation is faster than the possible action. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so I don't know how to systemize this, and I hate that word, but I don't know what the process is for converting the richness of this into ultimately large groups of individual clusters of social change agents which is where well, I like to see this go. <laughs> yeah, no, and I think that this, this is where we, this idea of, um, you know, we're talking at two, you know, two levels. One is we're having an open global mind type conversation, right? The other conversation is what is the open global mind and how do we set it up so that it works for, you know, and this notion of this conversation is different than the service layer, which is the translation mechanism from, you know, uh, what is the super organism that I hope we create called Open Global Mind and the other super organisms that exist in, in, in the world, right? When, and the dominant super organism of capitalism and, you know, the, the current, right? Or the super organisms that are, are China, Russia, whatever, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call them. Um, which are also adopting some of these other practices. And I think, I think we have to, we have to uh, first, maybe we first have to establish this as a super organism outside of the constructs and constraints of today's reality. And I don't, you know, and solving that problem allows for the invitation of more people into this. And, and then we have to build those services. And so Jerry's talking about story threading as a, as a business. What are those services that can translate this conversation into real action? And, you know, this is where I go to, um, you know, I'm working with a client right now, trying to propose to them that they um, build a separate entity within their system that is not their normal strategy and planning office but really is more of an open global mind that allows them to sense, sense make, 
and then ultimately connect in. And maybe that's the other place that we start is we have to sell into a system that is more contained 40,000 person organization than you know the 8 billion world and learn those translation techniques, right? Um, I agree in part, but there's a piece that I kept thinking in the back of my brain, this is like a resistance movement and I Correct. don't want to define it as resistance, but perhaps the mental engagement of people in open thinking is something that can move a lot faster than the technology. It also means that it is absolutely without central control, which in mm -hmm. a way is one of the issues, you know, I, I want to be sure that global mind is not centrally controlled and just becomes a different <clears throat> system that I'm re rebelling against personally. So we're now such a catalytic group of people and we're all over the world. And as this evolves, there will be more and more people because they'll fill in and participate in the groups that are being engendered. And maybe that in itself is something we want to foster and encourage and take personal responsibility to kick off in several different organizations with whom we interface and just let human evolution occur. I don't know if that's a realistic proposal, but it's kind of where my mind is warping right now. I, 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 will, put, I will add that it's probably unlikely we can interfere with human evolution happening, but <clears throat> we may be able to shape parts of it. Uh, Hadi, People have been interfering with human evolution since the beginning. Jerry. Exactly, exactly. They, they've been trying. Okay, thanks, uh, Jerry. So uh, this is my first time on a call. And to be honest, uh, I'm still uh, progressing towards understanding the intent. I'm not exactly sure what story threading is, but I am starting to understand. Uh, but something Judith said was uh, super interesting because uh, I actually had that in my own thought process uh, like uh, many times. Uh, and it's, it's funny to hear somebody else say it, uh, which is, I think for the kinds of problems which we have, these are nexus problems uh, many times. And uh, so they need different structures to solve them. Uh, so those, those have different network structure. And, uh, you know, if, just putting it in the frame of this conversation, like the typical hierarchical feudal uh, kind of structure or whatever, I would not say it's a machine in the sense that somebody sat and designed it like an engineer and then it got implemented in some process. Uh, for me, it's more of an emergent uh, structure which comes out of uh, something more fundamental and, and, and below actually. And uh, the question is what? And I've been thinking about this for some time and uh, you know, it, uh, I can ask the question, before money was invented, uh, did the machine uh, emerge? Or was it that money started creating hierarchies of uh, dominance and you know, submission and you know, I have to follow orders and so on and so forth and therefore it emerged? And if we wanted different structures, uh, rather than sit and lay the bricks ourselves, uh, would we perhaps need to have a different understanding of what value means in the marketplace? And uh, this actually uh, ties into uh, some of the other stuff I've been, been reading, because when you start to actually value the true cost of things, right, uh, you have to move away from a one-dimensional metric to like higher dimensions. And uh, if we could somehow embed this in our uh, discourse and our narrative and so on and so forth, then it might lead to different emergent structures. For example, I do a lot of pro bono work for, uh, for, for NGOs, things like this. It gives me a reward. Love that, thank you. And, and I think that we, we have many different contexts and we have, I think one of the things that um, attracts, uh, one of the things that motivated me to invite many of you here and maybe trickle through the invitation was that we all have rich imaginations and, 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 and theories about how the world works and we've explored in with sometimes with tools, sometimes with conversations, how those things work. Ken and I have sat down over many a coffee, uh, uh, kicking around these things and I have learned a ton of, ask, ask him about command intent versus command push uh, sometime. Uh, a command, something like that. Anyway, I'm, I'm munging it just sitting here talking. Um, uh, Matt, since you just shared uh, the model, why don't you take the conversation for a sec? Yeah, and Hari, just to, to kind of give a sense of this of this thing, right? We live in a world that we analyze things, we make decisions, and we execute on those things. I think money actually is, this is a very transactional model, right? It moves through different steps. It's linear, right? Money is a, is a, uh, a human concept that allows for tran transactions between different people in this sort of this value exchange. And I think what we're talking about is this idea of moving to a place where there's sort of this continuous 
sensing and drawing in of information, knowledge from all sources of both current experience as well as every experience that's ever had in human history. And how do we draw on that information, this indigenous knowledge and all that stuff, bringing into a place where instead of using a single lens or a paradigm or the ideas of a single superorganism, that we actually um, use all of the all of the lenses and ideas and superorganism kind of based ideologies as a way of collectively making sense. And then by making sense, we're creating new meaning amongst ourselves. And so if we are agents of change, the people that are on this call, and all of us seem to be united in that we feel like we are, want to be agents of change, that by changing meaning together and creating meaning together, that, that meaning naturally turns into the way in which we act uh, upon the world. And if we draw people, more people into that sense-making process, and so this is, this to me is the ultimate change, is superorganism that exists today, mostly dominated by the US, you know, consumeristic, you know, models, right, that have been ported out through our movies and culture and all that kind of stuff. We need to create a new reality that people then can move to for, so that they can create that new meaning and then they become these agents of change. They start to behave fundamentally differently than they did today. And so this is a little bit of a, maybe a resistance movement is not the right thing because we're not resisting the future. Right. I think we're doing what Peter Van said, which is instead of just looking backwards um, and then moving forward, we're actually creating me meaning in a forward direction and therefore we're creating positive change in a forward direction. I know that's very theoretical, but that's kind of what this is all about. Yeah. I can understand it, what you're it, saying. It comes right back to the personal though, because each of us are automatically starting to include this thinking and processing in every group with which we interface. And right. people grab on and, and it, it starts to grow organically. And so I, that's why I didn't like the word resistance, um, but I love your models. So I hope those get posted into things and maybe you could share them in a way where we could play with them too. Let's go to Hari then Ken. I yeah, love it. Uh, Matt, uh, just uh, something which I wanted to, uh, because it's like related to something I, I've just been reading today. Uh, so money, we can think of as transactional, but uh, money is also, uh, you know, has a deeper meaning as far as I can see, which is when a society makes decisions, right? It computes cost benefits. Uh, for example, what is the cost of putting a nuclear power plant here versus the benefits? Usually these are translated into financial metrics, you know, uh, for example, even uh, the way ecosystem services are uh, evaluated and so on and so forth. So for me, money has a slightly dif uh, deeper meaning. And where I'm coming from is what you said about creating meanings and uh, culture, at least I understand it as shared meaning. Uh, it's very interesting because I've been studying this tool uh, or this technique called MCDA, which is multi-criteria decision analysis or something like this, which basically unbundles that money parameter. And uh, it's very interesting because they say in order to make the right decisions, uh, you need contextualization. And that contextualization needs, you know, the indigenous lens, the social and political embeddings into that decision-making framework. And this is part of, uh, a part of being in an information society as well. We need to contextualize with people's viewpoints. I mean, uh, just thought I would add that. Yeah, and I might, I might push back just a little bit on, um, you know, this the idea of decision making, the analysis that goes behind it, and, and then we make choices, and then we execute. Because this is, the, we've been, management theory has been trying to optimize each of these pieces for at least the last century, right? Um, and um, the, the reality though is decision making is like you lay out, you lay out a set of options and then you choose the best options based on the analysis, which is something that you conduct, which is a little bit of a monotonous and rigorous process that looks at things through the, the, through the lenses of the decision maker itself. And what we're trying to say is we want to, at least in my mind, destroy that system because that system believes that the human being and the individual in the system is the, is the ultimate agent of choice, right? This is, goes back to, I think, Peter, some of the things that you're talking about, which is we are, a sup we are not the super organism. We are, we are subservient to it. And the question becomes, how do, we, how do we become the super organism so that decision-making is not an individual act, but it just becomes a collective 
navigation of what is and what might be and what will be, right? And that's, that's, that's the part that I can't get my head around what that actually looks like in practicality, but my sense is that's where we need to get to. And every system that we put in there that moves it back down to individual false agency creates, creates friction in the ability of us emerging to what we're supposed to be, which is harmonious with the system that we're living in, which is the, the world, right? So I know that's a lot, again, sorry. I agree. So I'd just like to point out, there are good historical examples across this whole field. Uh, the German army's general staff, for one, um, you, 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 can, you, re, you, you pick promising people out of your organization, you give them advanced training, and you put them in command decisions, and you support them making decisions. It works. It works really well. It's worked in the past. There are historical examples of societies that were much more integrated with their sort of super organism. You can look at somebody like the Hopi or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the individual does cause a lot of problems, but I do believe the individual is is a result of the sort of like evolutionary machine. It mm. makes the world much more complicated, mm. much more interesting things. So does, uh, evolution seems to be interested in pushing the complexity boundary. But so anyway, I, I, I just mostly wanted to say there are good historical examples about all the things we're talking about, about how societies drive change by having groups that can effectively think about their problems and just um, enough. Uh, well, hold on. So I want to wrap this conversation at the half hour. I think 90 minutes is a long time for us to be doing this. So uh, I want to close up pretty quickly. I want to preface what Ken said, uh, which is too late because he already said it, but I want to preface what Ken said because anytime I talk about the German general staff or whatever, I always, I always start by saying, the German army was not what you think it is. Because <clears throat> I think everybody has in the back of their heads that this was the most command, the, the most hierarchical, disciplined, obey your, your superior kind of army there's ever been. And it turns out that Hitler inherits one of the smartest armies there's ever been. That Hitler comes into, uh, what, he doesn't assemble it, but, but it's been sort of cooking all this time since World War I. And the army is brilliant, and they're busy developing officers who are philosophers. These are really smart people whom they give a tremendous amount of autonomy in the field, right? And, and, and that method, and the American army just before World War I is among the stupidest there's ever been and among the most hierarchical. And if you do any kind of insubordination, you go straight to court martial and you are, you're going to have a really bad time of it. So that's, that's the matchup kind of across the world. But I say, I say all of that only as a preamble to, there are thousands and thousands of topics and issues and historical examples like what we just went into that are, that are in our heads, that are in the world, that are stories that are hidden. Uh, we mentioned, you know, uh, James, I mentioned James Scott here and, and uh, Kevin brought up Against the Grain also, which is this really interesting book because it makes you see grains differently, like, like how history happened. And my hope is that in our work together and in riffing on all these materials together, not that we achieve a grand unified theory that we can finally explain in four, in four videos, but rather that little light bulbs keep going off in participants and that all of these little light bulbs help us snap little synapses together that are ideas internal to our heads, but that are also contacts across our networks and that we can understand each other better and that we can approach people who have very different sets of ideas from ours and begin to understand where those came from and at least empathize with them and possibly even mold our ideas to one another and adapt and understand better how to go there. Um, and, and so that is an ongoing process and will happen forever. But, but when we enter these conversations that are kind of philosophical or political, historical or political, economical or whatever, um, Part of me is like really excited because I love them. Part of me is worried because I think that a third of the people in the room have just rolled their eyes back and are like, oh, not this argument again. And I, 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 I'm very interested in making this a place where 
we can all sort of learn, contribute, collaborate, and, and let those light bulbs keep, uh, keep firing. Judy, did you want to jump in? Well, I was just going to say that to me, what this is about is optimizing the generative creative process in as many different ways with as many different people as we can possibly engage because it'll take a life of its own. That's what happens. If something is a good change, people get behind it. They, they, they get a spark and then they change the direction because their spark leads to something else. And that's just fine because it's all that sparking to the future that is enabled as long as you don't try to constrain it into the right course of action. And that's the, this is, I don't know how to say it any, I'm not saying it clearly, that's the best I can do. That was pretty good, Judy, I like it. Anybody else, uh, wrapping thoughts for this call and you don't have to say them in wrap. Uh, Lauren. Uh, I think it would be really handy to uh, co-create a map of what our, we are interested in so we can all kind of look and see what is collective intelligence and uh, like, what are we what are we into here um like what are what are the tools we can all use or have even developed and um what are the um sub kind of areas and even those superpowers that we do those weird random things that um i think judy said like she's a connector i don't remember but i think that was what it is but those those little things there to actually put those on a map so that we can refer to that i love that idea and i have a bunch of that stuff in my brain for myself and i wish i could mash it up against everybody else's immediately right because uh, for example superpowers most people don't know what their own superpowers are like the real superpowers we take for granted uh, and, and it takes someone else holding up a mirror and saying, oh, no, 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 you're like three sigmas off the mean on this thing right here that you think everybody does well. You, you actually have a superpower there. And so I'm, yep. it would be fun to develop a, way, a little exercise, maybe an improv style exercise for people to reveal superpowers and then a place to put them in, in our shared space. And right now we have these primitive little tools. I have a Google Sites website, a LinkedIn group, this Google group that's messing up a little bit because uh, people are having frustrations with it. Uh, Zoom calls and the Zoom recordings that are on YouTube. Right now, we've got like, like these messy little tinker toy parts that are quite primitive. Um, how might we manifest the things that we're talking about here more richly uh, in ways that are more easily accessible, in ways that anybody could step in and go, oh, and get to that light bulb, get to that like little firing of an aha uh, that connects up again. So I'm, I'm hoping we do more of that. Other thoughts before we close this call? on this general vein. Great call. Thank you so yeah. much. Totally thank you so fun. much. Yeah. Um, nice meeting all you new folks. Yeah. Nice thank you. you thank you for being here very much. And I, le I learned and I like the hand sign too. <laughs> Good. This just means I agree. I disagree. Yeah. I kind of got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's sort of self-explanatory. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. See some of yeah, you want. Have a great day. Uh, the uh, sorry, uh, the invite for the second one, maybe I'm not sure uh, on the uh, the hold on for the for systems mapping, right? Yes, uh, uh, I don't think I'm on that. Or I will make sure you, I, I will send you the invite, and it's a different Zoom room. We're right now we're in a collective next Zoom room because they have okay, a okay. transcript function, which I don't have. Uh, this oh, afternoon okay. at one o'clock is in my Zoom room. I'll make sure you have the, the invite. I'll, I'll, I'm going to replicate it and put it on the uh. OGM list, which you are on, I believe, correct? Yeah, yeah, I'm on the list. I'm on the list. Great. So I'm going to duplicate. And Lauren, that. you'll send out the Zoom link for your discussion. Yes. Yeah, sure. Is there okay. an otter? Bye bye. Is there what? Is there an otter link? Uh, no, we're not using otter. So there's a, there's an otter integration with Zoom that mm -hmm. is part of the corporate uh, account with Zoom, which Collective Next has implemented. Okay, because I'd like to I'd like to um, be included on the uh, otter. I'm, uh, what I'm doing is I'm, I, I'm copying the transcripts onto my emails back to the list so they're attached. So you, you can find them right away there. I believe Hank is curating them into a Dropbox account where all of our files are actually being collected up. So we need to, okay. we need to make that accessible to everybody. Okay, cool. Perfect. Awesome, because it would be great to play with the transcripts of these calls. Totally agree. We'll get there. Thank you, Thank guys. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Have a great day, everybody. 
Bye, all. You too.